our planet of plenty, blessed, some say, with resources to feed three times the current population, blessed with a technology which allows one mechanized farmer to feed 25 people, and bedeviled by an inability to make these available to all people. Planet Earth divides in two, the hungry and the fed. You are looking at some 21st century citizens who are on the hungry side of the division. There are today over three billion people in the world. A billion and a half are being damaged in body or in mind because they do not have enough to eat. Most of the hungry live in Latin America, Asia, or Africa, continents which produce the most people and the least food. By the 21st century, the world will have a population of more than six billion. Three billion could be hungry. What would such a world be like? Nutritional bio Sanford Miller of MIT. I, this is a kind of a future that I shudder to think about. I think we don't have any choice. I think we're going to have to do something about it. And if we don't, then I'm going to be very happy not to be around to see what's going to happen. These are new arrivals in a hungry nation in Latin America, tiny losers in a race between production and reproduction. Around the world, 250 children like these will die as you watch this broadcast. The stark facts are these. Population will double by the 21st century. Three quarters of that increase will take place in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, which even today cannot feed their population. There are three ways the food supply might be increased by the 21st century. Use old land more efficiently. Use new land. Forget about land and build food in the laboratory. These methods will all work for the well-fed nations. Computers and satellites may help the farmer with his decisions. The consumer may help himself to soybean steak or a bacteria burger. But will they work in the countries where these babies live? Countries where simple pests destroy 50% of the harvest. Countries where there is no more open land. Countries where there is neither time nor money to build laboratories. No time to do anything but survive. This is Guatemala. Lush soil, a good climate for coffee, bananas, corn. But in the midst of this plenty, there is hunger. 71% of the children are malnourished here. A good climate also for political revolution. Four out of five hungry nations have suffered violent political upheavals in the past 10 years. ¿Qué es esto? Brocha. muy bien. ¿Y esto? Hunger's effect on the body is known. Its effect on the brain only guessed at. This child's intelligence is being tested at INCAP, the Institute of Nutrition of Central America and Panama. ¿Cómo se llama esto? La luna. Can he form concepts? Is he curious? 80% of a child's brain growth occurs by the time he is three. How many children who will live in the 21st century have already suffered irreversible brain damage? a twilight generation that might lead us into chaos. There are a few hopeful signposts. In Caparina, a low-cost, high-protein food supplement is one of them. In Caparina, tastes like a soup Guatemalans love. Nutrition workers find it is not enough to make a food available. It must also be desirable. Even a hungry man does not like to eat food that is unfamiliar. The goal here, design a food that is cheap, but not known as poor man's food. Design a food that tastes good and is nutritionally valuable. Then sell it with all the fervor of a Madison Avenue campaign. In Caparina, contains as much protein as milk, but costs only one-fifth as much. Sí. 
Pero si no tenemos dinero, entonces compramos una bolsita de incaparina que cuesta solo... Nobody told the mothers of these children about incaparina. The children weigh a third less than they should. They are having lunch at a nutritional rehabilitation center, the first of its kind in Latin America. Here they come every day to eat balanced, protein-rich meals. And here their mothers come to learn some basic nutrition, to learn that babies need meat, eggs, and vegetables, foods they traditionally considered proper only for adults. The beneficiaries are not only these children, but their unborn brothers and sisters. If the mothers learn their lessons well, this rehabilitation center may be out of business by the 21st century. What can we do to make the land more productive? Already in business today is a system to make the deserts rich and fertile. The soil in deserts lacks just one ingredient to turn it into a green field, water. The idea here, build a plant to desalt the ocean water, attach some plastic bubble greenhouses, make the sand grow food. The plant operated jointly by the University of Sonora and the University of Arizona also produces pure drinking water and electricity. Food, water, and power are the basic needs of any community. This closed circuit system provides all three, a prefabricated lifeline for a 21st century city. As many plastic bubbles can be attached to the plant as the power source will allow. This pilot plant is run by a diesel engine. With cheap atomic power, many such plants might be built in the world's coastal deserts. This is the current crop of tomatoes. No products of the closed circuit process are wasted. Carbon dioxide, usually lost, is pumped into the greenhouses where it makes the plants grow faster. And the water the plants give off is trapped and returned to them. There are over 18,000 miles of desert shoreline, mostly in the hungry nations. Plastic bubbles on 5% of them might feed a billion people in the 21st century. The sea may be the most underdeveloped source of potential food. At the University of Washington, Lauren Donaldson is using technology to harvest the ocean's riches, aquaculture. Genetics is the key to this technology. Choose the best fish available and encourage them to have large families. Throw back the little ones. Design a huge, healthy hybrid in the laboratory. It is called selective breeding. First, the eggs are taken from these choice Chinook salmon. Then they are fertilized with sperm from the biggest, hardiest mayo Donaldson can find. Next, he puts the fertilized eggs in trays in his laboratory where they mature to fingerlings. He cultivates and weeds this fish farm as carefully as an efficient land farmer. He prunes out eggs that look damaged or fingerlings that look too puny. Before they are turned out to sea, the fish are branded just like cattle on the range. Proponents of aquaculture think that by the 21st century, we should treat fish more like cattle breed them selectively for desired traits, fence them in with electronic barriers, use dolphins as underwater cowboys to ride herd on them. After branding, the fish are released into the ocean. When they return to spawn, their vital statistics will sound like a fish story. They mature earlier than the wild salmon, are three times as big, 30 times as healthy, and produce 10 times as many eggs. Says Donaldson, we should be treating our fish like turkeys, not like buffalo. These carp are being treated with a variety of techniques to make them grow more flesh and fewer bones. At the Max Planck Institute in Germany, scientists have produced a fish that is almost a natural born fillet. These x-rays and diagrams compare the boneless carp to a normal carp. The fish have been selectively bred and live in heated, oxygenated water. They are fed with high-protein food and injected with hormones. In this tank is a normal carp and a treated carp. The fish given the scientific treatment is five times as big.
What you do to the fish after you've got him is equally important, especially if you live in a hungry nation. At the U.S. Bureau of Commercial Fisheries in Maryland, trash fish are ground up into a tasteless, odorless powder. It is called FPC, fish protein concentrate. Marine biologists estimate that fish in the U.S. coastal waters converted to fish flour could supplement the diets of a billion hungry. The cost, half a cent a day per person. Planners think that by the 21st century, we may have FPC factories floating on the oceans of the world. The concentrate contains 80% protein and can be added to soups, cereals, bread. Protein is the key to feeding the hungry nations. How about adding it to the plant itself? At Purdue, Oliver Nelson and Edward Mertz discovered a strain of corn that contains twice the normal amount of usable protein. Normal corn, its kernel surrounded by useless protein, is on the right. The high protein corn is on the left. Proteins are built from chemicals called amino acids. Some of these the body can build for itself. Eight of these proteins man must get from his food. The more the eight a food has, the more nutritious. Normal corn lacks adequate amounts of two of the essential chemicals. Mertz and Nelson discovered a strain that has double the short ingredients, making it as nutritious as meat. To the hungry, this may mean planting the same number of acres, eating the same amount, and thriving. By the 21st century, scientists hope to be able to find high protein rice and wheat as well. At General Mills, researchers are taking plants and turning them into something that tastes like meat. They take soybeans and transform them to familiar tasting foods with technology borrowed in part from chemistry and in part from the textile industry. First the beans are bathed in chemicals, then stretched into strands and woven into a kind of protein cloth. Oil seeds like soybeans are an excellent source of protein, cheap and available in many parts of the hungry world. The chemical baths remove a bitter taste and indigestible carbohydrates. The spinning gives them texture. By the addition of the right colors and flavors, the protein cloth can be made to taste like anything from strawberries to scallops to these small chips of bacon. Scientists admit that this technology does not today transfer across the gap between the hungry and the fed. It is too sophisticated and too expensive. Oil seeds like soybeans to provide the world with as much protein as currently comes from animals. By the 21st century, the experts think we cannot afford not to use them. Is land really necessary to grow food? Researchers at this British petroleum plant in Lavira, France, think not. Microorganisms, yeast and bacteria, are excellent protein sources. They also thrive on an unusual and cheap diet, oil. Yeast and bacteria fed with such petroleum byproducts means that food production can be moved off the land, away from the vagaries of weather, into the factory. It has been estimated that in the same amount of time it takes a thousand pound cow to produce one pound of protein. Microorganisms could produce 2,400 pounds. Single cell protein has been proven safe in animal feeding tests. We asked Dr. Sanford Miller if animals and plants might be too inefficient for the 21st century. The problem today is that the use of uh, animals as a converter of relatively low quality vegetable products, cereal grains and so on, uh, is so inefficient that because of our food needs, we can't afford to, to, to lose the amount of food that one normally loses in passing a grain through an animal to upgrade it. Uh, one way of getting out of this problem is by using materials that are not normally considered to be human foods and use them as animal foods so you're not taking anything away from uh, human uh, food needs. Uh, the result of this may be ultimately in the future, I can easily foresee, factory production of animals. Uh, animals raised in skyscrapers, for example, not requiring land for their production, being fed products that are also being raised uh, or produced in factories. And the whole output of the land, as we know it today, being used directly for human use, supplemented by this factory production of food. This is one way of, of increasing the dimensions of our food supplies. Another dimension might be to control the very process by which plants grow. At the University of California, Berkeley, a team headed by James Bassam is studying photosynthesis. 
This is the green plant system to convert sunlight and water into proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. First, they isolate the photosynthetic cells of a spinach plant. Next, suspend them in chemicals containing radioactive tracers. Then turn on the artificial sunlight in their laboratory garden. Turn the lights on. Five seconds to carbon-14 dioxide. Five, four, three, two, one, start. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, now. When the light hits the cells, they begin their work cycle. You are watching artificial photosynthesis. At the end of each countdown, Bassam records the output of these tiniest of food producers. Five seconds to next point. Five, four, three, two. He one. thinks that by the 21st century, the whole process of converting the sun's energy Five to seconds. food energy may be possible. Five, outside the plant, four, inside the laboratory. Two, More possible, one, manipulate the process inside the plant itself. Dr. Bassam. If we can learn how the plant regulates the flow of carbon in photosynthesis into the production of proteins, fats, and sugars, we may someday be able to uh, force the plant by means of chemical sprays or other techniques to produce more protein, for example, and less carbohydrate just prior to harvesting. The present time, uh, the jungle, of course, is uh, it consists of many leaves that are not really of, of too much use for food, but uh, if we can find a way a week or two before harvesting to, to convert these leaves into higher protein substances, then perhaps they could be economically harvested and used either as fodder for animals or processed directly and used as uh, food and protein sources for man. What works in a university laboratory seldom works in a hungry nation. 21st century technology is too expensive for most of the hungry nations. This is the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Its purpose, get the technology out of the laboratory, get it into the fields, get it to the farmer, get it to where the problems are. The Institute's director, Dr. Robert Chandler. Uh, we came here to find the basic reasons why rice yields are so low. Why are they only 1,400 pounds per acre, roughly? And we found the big problem was that rice was too tall. It, the tropical rice was tall and leafy. When the winds came, the rains came, it, it fell down. We put on fertilizer, and it got more leafy, it got taller, it went down earlier. And we found that putting on very much fertilizer, we got lower yields, and we put on none. And yet, if you didn't put on enough, or any, why well, you got uh, quite, uh, quite low yield. So they were stuck either way. So we have now developed short, stiff strawed, upright leaf plants that will respond to fertilizer that don't fall over, that stand up straight right to the day of harvest, and we have doubled and tripled and sometimes quadrupled yields. Yield improvement may be the only way for Asia to avoid mass starvation by the 21st century. There is no open land, so the only option is to make already planted land produce more. To find this triple yielding rice, the Institute tested over 10,000 varieties, testing to see what works for Asian soil, for Asian climate, and for Asian tastes. The future may bring varieties which are not only high yield, but high protein as well, like the corn at Purdue. Varieties which people in a specific region would like. Researchers at the Rockefeller Ford Foundation Supported Institute think that all of this will happen in time. The question is, is there enough time? In the long run, what is going on here may yield results as important as the high yield rice itself. This is a class for agricultural specialists, many with advanced degrees. They get their training at mud level, learning by doing. Turn, turn to the left. Just relax with the rope, okay, go ahead. Okay, just... In this field, you see different symptoms of disease and pest. We have here stem borer attack. We have here a bacterial leaf blight, the most serious attack. When they return home, they will become the teachers. The goal is to build a cadre of native agricultural experts who no longer depend on giveaways of food or education from the fed nations. Give a man a fish, an old proverb says, 
and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. This man is the target of the Institute trained specialist, the individual farmer. A better rice is useless unless people know it and accept it. A farmer who has been doing things the same way for generations changes hard, but can be changed by hard facts. Show him that he can grow more on the same land in the same time, and show him he can make money doing it. Uh, we have found that the farmer's income is gone, I mean by income profit, clear profit, after paying all expenses, has gone from an average of 700 pesos per hectare to 1,400, doubled. Doubled his profit. And that's the big incentive. That's the reason he's doing this, because he makes more money. He did not for love of country or something else. He's doing it because that's the way he can increase the standard of living for himself and his family. The International Rice Research Institute has helped make the Philippines self-sufficient in rice production for the first time in 65 years. More protein by the 21st century will come from the farm, the factory, the laboratory. But as a presidential commission recently pointed out, the heart of the problem is not where to get more food. It is in how to get it to the hungry. And this involves politics, economics, and the will of men to do something not only about food supply, but population control as well. Dr. Chen. Uh, it is possible that the um, food production rate will exceed the population uh, uh, increase rate for a while. Uh, it may be that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we'll be all right as far as food is concerned. But in the long run, we've got to do something about population because the land area of the world is essentially a constant. The energy coming from the sun is a constant. And eventually, that's going to, there's going to be a limit beyond which we can't do much, go beyond. But as far as uh, population, and that just keeps on increasing. You see, 2 to 3% per year increase all over Asia is going to add millions and millions of people. India, for example, has 13 million more people to feed next year than it had last year, or has this year. Uh, 13 million every year, more people, and they'll get bigger and bigger as the, as the, as the base gets larger. Uh, here in the Philippines, they're producing a million more every year. And those people all have to be fed. Malnutrition during early stages of life in the human, probably for the first three years of life, produces an individual that is probably not as intellectually capable as uh, they might be. They have not realized their potentials. And this is, seems to be irreversible. And so what are we going to do? Develop a whole generation or generations of individuals that are, in fact, living in a twilight world, uh, somewhere between being dead and being a vegetable? This is that twilight generation today. These babies are the current losers in the race between food and population. But there is technology which can better the odds of this deadly race. Soybeans into meat. Corn into super corn. Rice into triple rice. Deserts into gardens. Jungles into farms. Babies with the odds against them into babies starting even. The real question is whether the world will use this technology for the benefit of all people. The kind of a world we live in by the 21st century will depend on whether we are as wise as we are ingenious.